Good afternoon. My name is Craig Barnes. I have the privilege of serving as the president of this wonderful seminary. This afternoon, we are honored to welcome Michael Gerson to our seminary. We're here this afternoon in the midst of an election week in a season of deep polarization in our democracy. And as a people of faith who are part of a seminary community that is dedicated to scholarship and leadership, we need to think about how our faith tradition can serve as a force for good and for healing within our society. Today, we have a thought-provoking conversation partner and Michael Gerson. Michael Gerson is a columnist for the Washington Post and a regular commentator on PBS NewsHour, Face the Nation, and other programs. Mr. Gerson served as a top aide to President George W. Bush as assistant to the president for policy and strategic planning. Prior to that appointment, he served in the White House as deputy assistant to the president and director of presidential speech writing. He is the senior advisor at ONE, a bipartisan organization founded by Bono, which is dedicated to the fight against extreme poverty and preventable diseases. Michael Gerson is an astute commentator of public and political life, and he's deeply informed by his Christian commitments. If you've read any of his recent columns, I think you will detect an urgency in his voice for a moral vision that might inform our common life. It is Michael Gerson's conviction that faith commitments might provide an antidote to the divisions that plague us. He has written, we need a journalism that vividly describes worlds that are not our own and invite us to enter them in positive ways. We need a politic that calls us to the common good and not the triumph of our tribe. The cause of moral leadership is not hopeless because words have the power of life and not just death. They can allow us for a moment to enter the experiences of others and widen just a bit the aperture of our understanding. And our nation is in desperate need of that kind of leadership again. It's my hope through our time this day, we can enlarge the aperture of our understanding and think together about the nature of moral leadership. Please join me in welcoming Michael Gerson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be at this great center of learning and spirituality. And I'm so grateful to Craig for a kind introduction. When I um, asked my friend Pete Weiner how I should uh, think about Craig Barnes, he uh, sent me an email saying, Craig is a man who has received grace in his life and has spent much of his life extending it to others. It is um, hard to imagine higher praise. And I thank all of you for your kind welcome. That, we, that said, as an evangelical, I would probably have been more theologically comfortable here in the 70s, the 1870s. Um, <laughs> that's when the uh, great Princeton evangelical Charles Hodge explained, quote, I am not afraid to say that a new idea never originated from this seminary. <laughs> that's true. Those of you on the faculty have probably thought the same while grading student papers. Um, I, in this sense, the uh, natural successor to the old school Princeton Seminary may well be the Republican Party. Um, Republicans suffered a major defeat two days ago, or as President Trump calls it, a major victory. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I voted a straight Democratic ticket. That is either a natural political response to an unprecedented electoral situation or a sign of the end times. <laughs> Take your pick. Um, 
There is um, much to say about the midterm election, which returned a measure of accountability to the executive branch while revealing a series of social cleavages that seem to render a consensus politics impossible. But my purpose this evening is not to talk directly about politics. Specifically, I am not going to talk much about President Trump. Some think I have become obsessed with him and are tired of it. My wife Dawn gets the worst of it, so she has imposed a strict rule. For every mention of Trump, she collects a $20 fine. <laughs> and she is close to buying her Range Rover. This evening, I'll talk about some deeper trends, not a red wave or a blue wave, but the cultural waves that political figures fight or ride. These currents ultimately have causes and implications in the realm of ideas, and I want to talk about that. But let me tar start by uh, telling you just a little bit about myself. A few of you may have vaguely recognized me. The most common thing I hear in airports after I've made an appearance on Meet the Press or the PBS NewsHour, oh, you're that guy who is not David Brooks. <laughs> that has actually happened to me. Um, I didn't uh, take the traditional Washington path. I was a theology major at Wheaton College in Illinois. As uh, most of you know, it's a pretty religiously conservative place. The joke on campus when I went there was that the administration had banned premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> but my driving interest was political. I spent some time as a speechwriter and policy advisor on Capitol Hill. I spent some time in political journalism. Then I got a call from then Governor George W. Bush of Texas who wanted to meet me at a DC hotel. The first thing he said was, this isn't an interview, I've read your stuff, I want you to write my announcement speech, my convention speech, and my inaugural address, and I want you to move to Austin immediately. At that point, he wasn't even a declared candidate, but I packed up my family and went. From the beginning, we were a bit of an odd couple. He is outgoing, social, athletic, likable, and I'm actually none of those things. Uh, <laughs> He has a uh, penchant for locker room humor that makes me uncomfortable. I remember after one policy session at the governor's mansion in Austin, everyone had gone but me, and the governor had some time before his next appointment. He asked me, do you want to hang out a little while? With a rudeness that now seems crazed, I replied, not really. <laughs> Which is not the way to treat a future president. But I came to respect Bush as a politician and a person. He is, above all, a man without a mask. Interest, frustration, boredom, sadness come filtered, unfiltered to his face. He is kind and loyal to the people around him, and he can occasionally be sharp-tongued. Every year on the day of the State of the Union, the President sits down with all the network anchors for a time of question and answer. At one of these sessions, the late Peter Jennings asked him, what does it feel like to go before the nation and read someone else's words? The president immediately replied, you do it every night. <laughs> My uh, life changed direction on um, September 11th, 2001, like the lives of many people. I was working at home. The president was in Florida when my deputy, who was Pete Weiner at the time, was watching events in New York and said that I needed to come in immediately. I was headed into work on a clear morning down Interstate 395 when I saw a plane flying low over the highway, headed toward the Pentagon, so low that I could see the windows clearly. Days later, I sat in the National Cathedral for the memorial service, and I saw how in a few historical moments, the words, the rhetoric can actually matter to the country. The president said, this world he created is of moral design. Grief and tragedy and hatred are only for a time. Goodness, remembrance, and love have no end. And the Lord of life holds all who die and all who mourn. It is one of the nice things about being a former White House speechwriter. You can quote the President of the United States and really be quoting yourself. <laughs> the pace of those years, including 9-11, war, and natural disaster, was at times exhausting. It has a cost to your health. 
In December of 2004, while working on the President's second inaugural address, I had a heart attack. The President's doctor had me checked into the hospital under an assumed name to avoid all the press calls. Adding insult to incapacity, there wasn't a single call. <laughs> and it has a cost to your family. During the heat of the 2004 presidential election, my little boy Nicholas, then six years old, announced me, to me in the car that he wanted John Kerry for president. When I asked him why, he said, so you can be home on weekends. My nine-year-old was a little more practical then said, but how would we eat? <laughs> I told him, I think I can get a job. I might go to a think tank. And he said, of course, what is a think tank? So I told him, well, it's people who read and speak and have meetings and things. And Bucky, and this is true, said, you mean they don't do anything? <laughs> After the uh, 2004 election, my job at the White House changed. I became a policy advisor focused on global health and development and genocide prevention, areas where my interests had been leading me for many years. And I saw something very hopeful. In one of the most bitter times of partisanship in modern history, I also found a number of issues where members of both parties and people of every ideology have come together. As part of my job at the White House, I worked with conservative and liberal groups to fight global AIDS and to confront malaria and to oppose global sex trafficking. And I've seen some odd alliances grow. I've gotten to know Bono of you two a bit. Several years ago, he invited me to the first rock concert I had ever attended, and it was loud. Soon afterwards, my wife and I had dinner with Bono, who is a very idealistic and principled man. After dinner, my wife told me, you may be idealistic and principled, but it would also be nice if you were rich and cool. <laughs> I've also met Angelina Jolie. My wife was there too, I think. <laughs> or so she tells me. Now I'm a columnist for the Washington Post, living under the tyranny of two uh, columns a week. And I'm a advisor at One, I'm an international grassroots organization founded by Bono and dedicated to fighting extreme poverty and preventable disease. I'll get started with a bit of a uh, confession. I actually like most politicians, and I know quite a few of them. They often make tremendous sacrifices of time and money and peace and reputation. But almost uniformly, when I talk to serious public servants, they complain of a political atmosphere more toxic than any they can remember. They complain of forces that seem to make our divisions deeper, and they feel deeply frustrated by their inability to serve the common good. So let me begin by highlight, highlighting three trends three challenges that damage our public life and undermine our best intentions as a people. The first is polarization. We live in a landslide country, just with different outcomes in different places. In the 2016 election, 80% of counties in America gave either Trump or Clinton a landslide victory. In the 1970s, that figure was more like 25%. Remember when Pauline Kael, actually I think the quote is fake, supposedly said, I can't believe Nixon won, I don't know anyone who voted for him. We live in increasingly um, similar political communities, in silos of the mind, with people that think just like us and often act just like us. This polarization is not just a function of Washington dysfunction. Americans are self-segregating in a variety of ways, politically, geographically, culturally, and our views of the opposing camp have become progressively more negative. Here is the conclusion of one recent Pew study, quote, these days Democrats and Republicans no longer stop at disagreeing with each other's ideas. Many in each party now deny each other's facts, disprove of each other's lifestyles, avoid each other's neighborhoods, impugn each other's motives, doubt each other's patriotism, can't stomach each other's news sources, and bring different values systems to such core institutions as religion, marriage, and parenthood. It is as if they belong not to rival parties, but to alien tribes." 
end quote. There are many reasons for this state of affairs, which would take a lecture series to explore. The ideological sorting of the parties is a powerful factor. Conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans are increasingly endangered species, and this ideological divide between parties tends to turn every issue into a cultural war battle. There are other factors, the growth of partisan media, including cable TV and talk radio, outlets that provide not information, but ammunition. There's the power of technology to mobilize factual, in, factional interests and allows people to live in filter bubbles. There is gerrymandering, leading to the constant fear of politicians that they will be primaried if they lack political purity. The result is a careful weaving of cocoons. One story illustrates this for me. David Wasserman of the Cook Political Report tells of meeting with a group of young Democrats in a wealthy suburban part of Northern Virginia. In the course of his presentation, he made reference to, quote, Cracker Barrel voters, those voters in counties with Cracker Barrel restaurants. Donald Trump won 75% of such counties. Excuse me, interrupted one of the young liberals, you must have it wrong. Do you mean crate and barrel? <laughs> This is an extreme form of a cultural bubble, a life arranged by faith and choice so that other ways of life are unimaginable. When Americans start seeing their fellow citizens as fundamentally different and dangerous, a line is crossed. Our democratic institutions are designed for disagreement. They are undermined by mutual contempt. Unfortunately, the incitement of contempt can work politically at least in the short term. We've seen the kind of leadership that fans frustration into fury. This kind of divisive politics has the chemical advantage of lighting up the limbic system, the powerful emotional center of the brain. If I remember my Psych 101 correctly, this portion of the brain includes the hypothalamus, which regulates the four Fs, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and mating. The um, politics of polarization can carry an election and wreck a democracy. The largest problem with political tribalism is, sim is simple. When the other side is viewed as evil, then collaboration is not only hard, it is wrong. Compromise and comedy become not virtues, but vices. And sand is thrown into the gears of government. It's hard for people to care deeply about public events. It's hard for me to resist polarization, but it starts with an adjustment in attitude. I want to borrow an idea from the Franciscan priest Richard Rohr. He says that the prophetic stance is to live, quote, on the edge of the inside. Prophets fully belong to a community, but have just enough distance to see it with clear eyes. To live on the edge of the inside, Rohr says, is different than being an insider, a company man, or a dues-paying member. Yes, you have learned the rules and you understand and honor the system as far as it goes, but you do not need to protect it, defend it, or promote it. It has served its initial and helpful function. You have learned the rules well enough to know how to break the rules without really breaking them at all, not to abolish the law, but to complete it, as Jesus rightly puts it. A doorkeeper must bo love both the inside and the outside of his or her group and know how to move between those two loves. So we should strive to be doorkeepers of our ideological traditions, committed but not blind in our commitment, knowing both the inside and outside of our group and finding sympathy for both. So polarization's the first trend. The second confirmation bias is related. No matter how good we think our case, we are probably not going to argue our way to unity. Social science has revealed something I find unsettling. The more knowledge that partisans have, it turns out the more stubborn they become in their beliefs. The largest problem is not so-called low information voters. It is people who use their brain power to support the views of their tribe. So Republicans, for example, who have a higher level of scientific knowledge are actually more skeptical of global warming, even though the evidence for climate disruption by any objective standard is compelling. 
Consider one example. When social scientists showed aerial pictures of Donald Trump's inaugural crowd and Barack Obama's inaugural crowd, which was clearly larger, to voters, many who supported Trump thought his crowd was bigger. They were not lying. They were demonstrating that group commitments often have more power than reason itself. Confirmation bias can not only be absurd but destructive. In a 2006 survey, a majority of Democrats agreed that it was likely or somewhat likely that George W. Bush was complicit in the 9-11 attacks. In a 2015 poll, 43% of Republicans believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim. One gets the impression in both cases that partisans would have agreed with any polling description they perceived as negative. People seem eager to use whatever stick comes to hand. How do we begin to confront this deep human tendency? I think it begins by being willing to call out your own side to make a fair judgment no matter who benefits. Calling out the other side really doesn't work very well. When Obama criticizes conservatives or when Trump criticizes liberals, views are only entrenched. But it is different and powerful to police your own. Be an advocate, even a partisan, but show some intellectual honesty. It has never been more important. I've met some politicians willing to do that. Senator Jeff Flake has often played that role in the GOP, and Senator Chris Coons has often played that role in the Democratic Party. And politicians like former Senator Bob Dole have a habit of calling it like it is. In 1996, I remember then-speaker Newt Gingrich had a 16% approval rating in the polls. At one event, he turned to Dole and asked, Bob, why is it that people take such an instant dislike to me? Dole replied, Newt, because it saves them time. <laughs> At least that's the way Dole tells it, um, who I worked for during that, his 1996 presidential run. He has a famously sharp tongue as well. I remember him saying that Al Gore was so stiff, his Secret Service code name was Al Gore. The hardest thing is to confront confirmation bias in ourselves. It would be very difficult for me, to be honest, to praise good and important things accomplished by Donald Trump. I'll tell you when it happens. Um, all of us have the tendency to see an enemy when we really need a mirror. We also see an enemy when we need a certain kind of friend. For me, it has been important to have friends with very different views than my own. It shows me that deep disagreements can also be honest disagreements, and it helps expose when I'm guilty of groupthink. Here, I'll borrow an idea from C.S. Lewis that Pete Weiner um, pointed out to me. Lewis talked of the need for what he calls first friends and second friends. Quote, the first friend, he said, is the alter ego the man who first reveals to you that you are not alone in the world by turning out beyond hope to share all your most secret delights. But the second friend is the man who disagrees with you about everything. Of course, he shares your interests, otherwise you would not become a friend at all. But he has approached them all at a different angle. He has read all the right books, but has gotten the wrong things out of every one of them. And then you go at it, hammer and tongs, far into the night, night after night, each learning the weight of each other's punches. Actually, though it never sees, seems so at the time, you modify one another's thought. Out of this perpetual dogfight, a community of mind and deep affection emerges." End quote. In this time of division, mistrust, and motivated reasoning, reasoning all of us could use more second friends. My third point has some added urgency because of recent political events. The destination of our divided politics, unless we turn aside, is dehumanization. There is life and death, as the scriptures stay, say in the power of the tongue. Words can provide permission for prejudice. I have a friend at the University of Pennsylvania, a researcher named Emil Bruno, who has been studying politics in the country of Hungary. Emil has devised a disturbing scale 
to measure blatant dehumanization. In September of 2014, a sample of Hungarians was asked to place Muslim migrants somewhere on the familiar Ascent of Man scientific illustration, the one showing the gradual development from ape to homo sapien. Not long afterwards, the right-wing populist government stepped up its anti-immigrant rhetoric and built a barbed wire fence along the border to keep refugees out of the country. After this controversy, the same survey was conducted the level of dehumanization in Hungary had doubled in one year. He concluded, violent and dehumanizing political rhetoric can increase support for violence against people already predisposed towards aggression. And here I can't av avoid the current moment, and I can't avoid being blunt. In our recent election, the president's final political appeal was literally to warn that brown people were invading the country. Then he promised to have them shot. It was racism unadulterated. His base of support, millions of people, skewed white and male, found this message acceptable or compelling. There is no denying that dehumanization has become explicit in our public discourse. Refugees are referred to as animals. Mexican migrants are called rapists and murderers. Muslims are treated as threats. Jews are tagged with ancient stereotypes. This type of language, as sociologist David Livington Smith has said, quote, acts as a psychological lubricant, dissolving our inhibitions and inflaming destructive passions as such, it empowers us to perform acts that would, under normal circumstances, be unthinkable." End quote. Um, as I uh, have mentioned before, great, world, great world words can heal and, and inspire. But the corollary of that is that an ethic of bigotry can uh, encourage acts of violence by people unbalanced by bigotry. And I think the evidence was recently on full display in Pittsburgh. Dehumanization has a natural progression. It starts by defining a whole race or ethnicity by its worst members. It moves on to enforce generally applicable laws and rules that especially hurt a target group. Then as the public becomes desensitized, the group can be singled out for hatred and harm. It is the descent step by step into a moral abyss. It is not often that a nation is presented with a choice about its most basic founding beliefs. At one blessed moment in our history, the answer was that all are created equal and endowed with rights by our creator. It is a belief that judged our social practice in many ways, but haltingly, eventually, the ideal invaded our laws and our conscience and changed us for the better. This is my honest fear, that a new and lesser ideal will take hold, that the strong matter more than the weak, that the winners are superior to the losers, that human dignity stops at certain borders and certain groups and certain religions. I am afraid this ideal will invade our laws and our hearts and change us. All these trends, polarization, confirmation bias, dehumanization, existed before our current president, but they seem to have culminated in our time. They've led to disagreements that are so much deeper than normal politics can repair. Americans have not, uh, have not just different party homes and different policy views, but different values. A political scientist named Rob Weiler calls this moral polarization. There are many structural reasons for political division, but I don't have any structural answers for moral polarization. The response here can only gather life by life and choice by choice. The answer will be spiritual, not in the sense of piety, but in the sense of mutual grace. There is really only one force that can overcome moral polarization. It is empathy. It is the ability to put ourselves in the shoes of another, of a different party, of a different faith, of a different class. The failure of empathy is ultimately a moral and spiritual matter. 
Our nation is in deep need of healing truth and humanization, and religion has traditionally been one source of these commitments. Here on my own theory of calling out your own, I'll focus for a moment on my own theological tradition. My alma mater, Wheaton, was founded by abolitionist evangelicals in the mid-19th century. Its first president, Jonathan Blanchard, was an anti-slavery organizer and founder of radical newspapers. The college was a station on the Underground Railroad. Many northern evangelical Christian leaders of the time were malcontents in the cause of human dignity. Who could possibly describe the evangelical movement in those terms today? The predominant narrative of white evangelicalism is tribal rather than universal. Christians who once set America's moral and political terms are under legal and cultural siege by the forces of secularism. Now, in this view, they must find political allies and fight back before they are thrown to the lions. Here's a recent revealing quote from Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council. Conservatives, he said, quote, were tired of being kicked around by Barack Obama and his leftists. And I think they are finally glad that there's somebody on the playground that is willing to punch the bully, end quote. In this explanation, Trump's approach to public discourse is actually the, his main selling point. His bullying, his cruelty, crudity, and personal insults are admired because they are directed at enemies of our enemies from the evangelical perspective. This attitude is perhaps politically and psychologically understandable from any group that has lost cultural standing over the years, but it has nothing to do with the Sermon on the Mount, nothing to do with any recognizable version of Christian ethics. The very thing that should repel evangelicals and other Christians, Trump's dehumanization of others, is what seems to fascinate and attract some conservative Christians. It is the worst kind of discrediting hypocrisy. The Trump evangelicals are best understood as conservative political operatives seeking benefits for their interest group from politicians who are most likely to provide them. This, provides, this involves a certain view of power, the belief in power as political clout used to serve your own. So how good is the quality of their political judgment? I don't think it's particularly good. Identifying evangelicalism with et ethno-nationalism may have some short-term benefits, particularly when it comes to judicial nominees, but public influence eventually depends on the, on the persuasiveness of public arguments, and close ties to Trump will eventually be disastrous to causes that evangelicals care about. Pro-life arguments are discredited by an association with misogyny. Arguments for religious liberty are discredited by association with anti-Muslim bias. Arguments for family values are discredited by nativist disdain for migrant families. And the ultimate harm is the reputation of faith itself. The identification of evangelical Christianity with white grievance is a grave matter. Evangelical Christians hardly distinguished themselves during the civil rights movement in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Some used Christian academies as cover for the continued segregation. Getting this issue wrong again in our time would be particularly damning in a nation and in Christian churches growing inexorably more diverse. According to a recent Pew Research poll, white evangelical Protestants are the least likely group in America to affirm an American responsibility to accept refugees. The least likely. Evangelicals insist on the centrality and inerrancy of scripture and condemn society for refusing to follow biblical norms. And yet when it comes to verse after verse requiring care for the stranger, they do not merely ignore this mandate, they lead the nation in opposing it. How can this possibly be? This state of affairs represents a failure of Christian political leadership. Even more, it indicates the failure of the Christian church in the moral formation of its members, who remain largely untutored in the most important teachings of their own faith. Where is the moral fun, uh, formation of many religious Americans taking place? On social media, 
that has increased the velocity of lies and conspiracy theories, on cable stations that make money through incitement, on talk radio that paints every opponent as an enemy of the country, on internet sites that trade in racism and anti-Semitism. I don't have answers for all this, but I will make one claim. It would be helpful for Christian political engagement to have some root in Christian ideas. This is a matter of getting our theological principles right and teaching them boldly and clearly to people in the pews to stand for something better and higher than our degraded discourse, something better and deeper than our tired, angry ideologies, something better, just better. A distinctly Christian approach to public engagement begins with a certain anthropology. There are many elements of the Christian faith that have no political significance at all. Christian soteriology and Christian ecclesiology are hugely important, important, but they have no proper place in public life. Yet a Christian anthropology, a transcendent vision of human rights and dignity, has grabbed reformers and activists in every generation by the collar and never let them go. They all carried the same message of human worth, a message that all of us have significance, not because of what we know, but because we are known. Not because of what we achieve, but because we are loved. Known by God, loved by God, valued and welcomed by God across every race, across every border, across every division in our common life. This is not just a private moral matter. It is what the political scientist Glenn Tinder calls, quote, the major premise of all Christian political and social thinking, the concept of the exalted individual, end quote. It is rooted in the universality of God's agape love. It means there is a spiritual destiny for every human soul carried into limitless time. It involves the recognition that all of us, even you, even me, even everyone, share a legacy of dignity and worth. The Christian universe, says Tinder, is peopled exclusively with royalty. It also imposes the humility of knowing that this, this legacy is fully shared. In every way that matters to God, human beings are completely equal and completely loved. They can't be reduced to ethical object lessons. Their dignity runs deeper than their failures. They matter more than any cause. They are the cause. The opposite of dehumanization is humanization, and that can be re uh, reflected in a number of callings, as was mentioned in journalism and politics and religious leaders. But let me ad address the religious issue very quickly because I know there's some pastors in the room. Priests and pastors are generally not experts on public policy and should not pretend to be. Many of the debates surrounding, say, the issue of immigration are prudential rather than moral. I don't think there's a specifically Christian position on, say, building a border wall. It may be stupid and wasteful, but it is not inherently unethical to make a partially walled border into a fully walled border. But religious leaders have a solemn moral duty to oppose the dehumanization of migrants in the course of that discussion something that violates the vision of human dignity and equality at the heart of the Christian faith and other faiths as well. Human beings in this view are not merely arrogant hominids programmed for sex and death. They bear God's image, and in the Christian view, their flesh somehow once clothed God himself. This means that cruelty, bullying, and oppression are cosmic crimes. This leads to another theological principle. A distinctly Christian approach to social engagement requires a commitment to the common good. Pope John Paul II defined this as, quote, the good of all and of each individual because we are really responsible for all. It is the set of social circumstances that allows everyone to flourish. At one level, Christianity is deeply individualistic promising a personal relationship to the creator and imposing a set of individual moral responsibilities. But Christianity is also inherently communitarian. What my friend Jim Wallace describes as, quote, the call to a relationship that changes all our other relationships. 
The golden rule and the mandate to love your neighbor change so, challenge social systems based on tribe, class, or race. Christian ethics has been the halting, inconsistent, but continuing struggle to draw out the full implica implication of God's image in every life. Against libertarianism, the common good is not identical to the triumph of market forces. Constructing it is the shared duty of communities, corporations, and government. Against some forms of modern liberalism, the common good is not identical to the triumph of autonomy and choice. Humans flourish in a context of binding moral commitments such as family and marriage, and the most vulnerable members of the human community deserve special concern and protection. And against secularism, the common good is not achieved by banishing religion from the public square. Religious institutions perform works of mercy, carry ideals of justice, and should be sheltered by a generous application of religious liberty. John Chrysostom said, this is the rule of the most perfect Christianity, its most exact definition, its highest point, namely the seeking of the common good for nothing can so make a person an imitator of Christ as caring for his neighbors. In the political era of rights talk and special interest pleading, a greater emphasis on the common good would make America poli American politics more civil, admirable, and humane, and it would make clear that Christians do not constitute one pressure group among many. Instead, they seek the good of the whole. A distinctly Christian approach to social engagement must take seriously the idea of the kingdom of God. How believers understand this concept determines much about the nature of their political engagement, which determines much about the quality of American politics. If you look at his words, Jesus did not preach a new religion. He announced the arrival of a kingdom. The kingdom of God has come near, he said. It was intended to be um, a message of dawning hope and liberation. Quote, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering to, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This kingdom, against the messianic expectations of some of Jesus' followers, did not involve a revo revolt against the Romans. It is, Jesus said, not of this world. He said that the rule or reign of God has broken into human history in some new and different way. And the evidence is provided by people who will live by the values of this divine kingdom in the midst of every earthly kingdom. Believers are essentially called to be emissaries or ambassadors, every believer. The nature of this kingdom determines how it is properly advanced. You can't advance a vision of liberation by oppressing the, by oppressing the conscience of others. You can't advance a vision of human dignity by dehumanizing others. You can't advance a vision of peace with violent and demeaning language. This involves an entirely different view of power, power for the sake of the powerless. It involves a different definition of influence, bringing a modicum of grace and justice into the world around us, including the political world. The proper role of Christians in politics is not to Christianize America, it is to demonstrate Christian values in the public realm. And this brings a kind of influence that does not depend on a welcome at the White House. And finally, a distinctive Christian approach to public engagement requires us to remember our history and recover our heroes. It is my theory that people cannot be the leaders they need to be until they remember who they once were. And this is also the theory, by the way, of my new book contract with Simon & Schuster. I have less than a year to write a series of profiles of American and British men and women who have modeled Christian social engagement over the last few hundred years. So far, it is my experience that most religious people are almost entirely ignorant of their own history. It is also my experience in starting my research that this history is rich beyond measure. There are great heroes of 19th century evangelical social reform, 
who stood up to slavery and confronted the squalor and exploitation of the Industrial Revolution. They're the voices of African-American prophetic tradition, who were the instruments by which a hypocritical nation was called to its own ideals. They're men and women influenced by Catholic social thought, the defenders of immigrants and of solidarity with the poor and weak. And there are representatives of the social gospel who embraced both sacrificial service and progressive reform. I have no idea who will actually read such a book, or more importantly, buy such a book. But hopefully there is some value in giving people back their history. Without the influence of these religious traditions, America would have been a colder and crueler and less just place. And without recalling these examples, I don't think we will find the inspiration to move forward. Those taking their instruction from Fox News are eating mud pies while a great banquet of idealism and purpose awaits. I want to close on one point of inspiration. In the face of division, anger, and verbal violence, faith calls attention to a hopeful alternative. One of the greatest lessons of life and one of the deepest lessons of cultural change is the ability of compassion and generosity to break down even thick walls of contempt. When I met the Dalai Lama a few years ago, he talked about the power of, quote, the undiplomatic smile to melt human barriers. There is the power of the kind word, the unexpected favor, the genuine compliment. This is the strange alchemy of empathy. We serve our principles best by loving people even more than our principles. This is not flabby or passive, at least it wasn't for Martin Luther King Jr. Quote, Love has within it redemptive power, he said. And there is power there that eventually transforms individuals. Just keep being friendly to that person. Just keep loving them, and they can't stand it too long. Oh, they react in many ways in the beginning. They react with guilt feelings, and sometimes they'll hate you a little more in the transition period. But just keep loving them. And by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. Here is the redeeming value of our moment. Viruses create their own antibodies. We value more dearly what might be lost. We've had a taste of nihilism and chaos. We've looked into the abyss, and we know this cannot be our destination. I'm confident in the long run that people will choose decency and shared progress over the cruel pleasures of blame and spite, or so I try to believe. The best recent example of this took place in Charleston following the racist church shooting that took nine lives at the Emanuel African American Episcopal Church. The killer chose a historic African American church for a reason. For centuries, black churches have been a place of refuge, a voice for social justice, and a target of racist violence. The gunman drove two hours to Charleston, South Carolina because he wanted a symbol and he got one. Against all his intentions, it is now the symbol of a living faith. The killer set out to defi defile a sacred place and ended up showing why it is sacred. When many relatives of those cruelly murdered in Charleston publicly offered their forgiveness, it was stunning and admirable in many ways, not least of, not least of which it provided a contrast to our political culture. So many are engaged in a search for evidence of their own victimization in order to justify their anger. Here, genuine victims of a horrible crime responded with love and mercy. At the heart of the Christian faith is an impossible demand to love your neighbors, to do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. This teaching was demonstrated by its author. The novelist George MacDonald wrote, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, said the divine making excuses for his murderers, not after it was all over, but at the very moment when he was dying at their hands. When we see this type of extreme grace reenacted, as in Charleston, it has tremendous power. At some level, it is simple. Christians gain influence, real lasting influence, when we act like Jesus, when people, including modern, cynical people, see the image of Jesus even partially reflected in another human being. It appeals across every distinction, every division, every boundary. It stirs the deepest longings of the human heart. 
when the representatives of, of Christ act like Jesus, true influence returns, the only kind in the end that is worth having. Thank you so much.